Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming again. Uh, we're in for a treat today. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, again, I want to thank our uh, underwriters for making this free to all of us. Uh, Tucson Electric Power, Roche, Accelerate Diagnostics, Arizona Daily Star, Canyon Ranch, Cox Communications, the Friends of the Galileo Circle, Godet Design, Halualoa Companies, Marshall Foundation, Wynn and Tarbit Patent Law, Raytheon, Research Corporation for Science Advancement, and Tech Launch Arizona. Well, while all of you were sort of uh, enjoying your weekend, we were all in a big panic here because Luis was stuck in New York. He made it today around noon, uh, and here he is to give us a presentation which I think is gonna wow us all. And before that, he had pneumonia. Anyway, it's been a, a journey. So the fact that he's here to be with us is, is quite, I thank you so much for that. A little bit about Luis von Ahn. Um, he's an entrepreneur and a computer science professor at Carnegie Mellon in, uh, University. Considered by far one of the pioneers of crowdsourcing. He's known for co-inventing CAPTCHAs, being a MacArthur Fellow, and selling two companies to Google in his 20s. He's a co-founder and CEO of Duolingo, so if you want to learn languages, he's the guy a language learning platform created to bring educa language education to the world, has 200 million users. It is by far the most popular uh, learning language platform, uh, downloaded app in education, and it's free. Luis has been named one of the 10 most brilliant scientists by Popular Science Magazine, one of the 50 best brains in science by Discover, one of the top young investigators under 35 by MIT Technology Review, and one of the 100 most innovative people in business by Fast Company Magazine. Please welcome Luis von Ahn. That's entitled, What Can Humans Do That Machines Can't? And, and I'm going to talk about all of that, but actually I'd like to change the talk, the title at least, to just three things I've done. Uh, so and I'll start with the first one. And, and the, for the first one, I'm going to start by asking you guys a question. How many of you have had to fill out some sort of web form where you've been asked to read a distorted sequence of characters like this? OK, it's a question. So how many of you had to fill this crap out? OK. How many of you found it really, really annoying? Great, excellent. Uh, so I invented that. Uh, uh, that thing is called a CAPTCHA, and the reason is there is to make sure that you, the entity filling out the form, are actually a human and not a computer program that was written to submit the form millions of times. And the reason it works is because humans can read these distorted characters, but computer programs can't do it as well yet, as well as humans can. Okay? So, uh, for example, in the case of Ticketmaster, the reason you have to type these annoying distorted characters, the CAPTCHA, is to prevent scalpers from writing a program that can buy millions of tickets two at a time. Okay, so that's why that's there. Uh, now, these are served to people around the world literally millions and millions of times a day, and it used to be the case that the combinations of letters that were given were picked entirely at random. So P, C, 2, D, that's picked entirely at random. But since they're shown so many times, sometimes, the randomly chosen letters just happen to say something. So for example, we showed this at some point, the Yahoo registration. So the Yahoo registration page showed the letters W-A-I-T chosen entirely at random. Uh, now the funny thing is what happened about 20 minutes later, uh, the, <laughs> the help desk at, the, at Yahoo got this email, basically. <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> Oops. This, of course, was not as bad as this poor person. <laughs> <laughs> now, just to give some definitions here, a CAPTCHA is a program that can tell whether its user is a human or a computer. Okay, that's the definition of a CAPTCHA. So it doesn't have to be these distorted letters. It just has to be a program that can, that can differentiate whether it's talking to a human or a computer. Okay, let me give you, let me say this another way. A CAPTCHA is a program that can generate and grade tests that most humans can pass, but current computer programs cannot. Okay, so notice the paradox here. A CAPTCHA is a program that can generate and grade tests that it itself cannot pass. 
Okay, so in that way, captchas are a lot like some professors. We, <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> um, so the idea of a captcha is a lot more general than these distorted characters. I'm sure you've seen different things over time. Sometimes you have to click on the image, whether it's a cat or not a cat. In all of these cases, the idea is that you're given a test that it should be that only humans can pass, but that computers cannot. Okay? And there's a lot of these types of tests. Now, uh, let me tell you something that I did a few years after um, the original CAPTCHA. At some point, um, I did a little back-of-the-envelope calculation about how many CAPTCHAs were typed by people around the world. Uh, this was probably the year 2005, 2006, so about five years after the invention of the original CAPTCHA, I decided to estimate how many times somebody types a CAPTCHA throughout the world, and the number I came up with was about 200 million. So about 200 million times a day, somebody types one of these throughout the world. Now, when I first heard this number, I was very proud of myself. I thought, look at the impact that my work has had. Uh, but then I started feeling bad, because not only do people hate doing these, but also, each time you do one of them, you waste about 10 seconds of your time. It takes about 10 seconds to do this. And if you multiply 10 seconds by 200 million, you get that humanity as a whole is wasting about 500,000 hours every day typing these annoying CAPTCHAs <laughs> because of me. So. <laughs> I started feeling bad, and I started thinking, well, we can't just get rid of CAPTCHAs because the security of the web sort of depends on them, but is there anything else we can do? And then I started thinking, is there any way in which we can use this human energy, those 10 seconds while you're doing something for something that is good for humanity? See, during those 10 seconds, your brain is doing something amazing. Your brain is doing something that, by definition, computers just cannot yet do. So it's very valuable 10 seconds of, kind of human computation time so could we use it for something valuable? And the answer to that was yes, and this is what, um, this is what gave, gave rise to, to, to the next project that I did. It's a project called reCAPTCHA, where the idea was that as people were typing CAPTCHAs, they were going to be authenticating themselves as a human. That's the original idea of a CAPTCHA. But in addition to that, we would be getting them to help us digitize books. Okay, so let me explain how that works. So there's a, lot of process, there's a lot of projects out there that have been trying to digitize all the world's books. So for example, Google was trying to take all of the world's books that have ever been written and then digitize them so that they can be online accessible by anybody. Okay, now, the way, each, the way these processes work is that you start with a book, a physical book thing. You've seen those things, right? Like a book. <laughs> okay. So you start with a book, and then you, you scan it. Now, scanning a book, literally what it is, is it's taking a digital photograph of every page of the book. The next step, so what that gives you is it gives you one image for every page of the book. So it gives you photos of basically text in them. The next step in the process is that the computer needs to be able to decipher all of the words in these pictures of text. Okay, so that's so that you can search through the book, etc. So the computer needs to be able to decipher all the words. The problem is that for um, books that were written you know, more than 30 years ago, some of the ink has faded and the pages have turned yellow. So the words are hard to recognize for the computer a lot of times. But humans can read them. So what we started doing is we started taking all of the words that the computer could not recognize in the book digitization process, and, we're starting, and we started sending them to humans while they were typing CAPTCHAs on the internet to type them for us. Okay, so for example, next time you type a CAPTCHA, these words that you're typing, many of them, are actually words that are coming from books that the computer could not recognize, and we're using what you enter to help us recognize the book for the computer and then that book, that word kind of becomes digitized, and so this is what we're doing now. Let me explain something. Um, some of you may be wondering the following. Uh, this, is a, this is a word that we just got out of a book. The computer doesn't know what it is. We're going to give it to a human, and we're going to ask them to type it correctly, but how do we know whether they entered the correct answer? I mean, this, at the end of the day, this has to be a test that can distinguish whether you're a human or a computer, and this is a test where the computer itself doesn't even know the answer. So, the solution to this problem, and this is, this is why sometimes some of the CAPTCHAs that you see actually have two words as opposed to one. So what we're doing now is we're actually taking a word out of a book that the computer doesn't recognize, and then we're giving it to a human. And then in addition to that, we're taking another word for which the computer does know the answer, and we're putting them right next to each other. And then we're, not telling, and we're telling the human, please type both. We're not telling them which one's which, and then they have to type both. And if they type the correct answer for the one for which we already knew the answer, for which the system already knew the answer, then the system assumes that they are human. And it also gets some confidence that they typed the other word correctly. 
And if we repeat this process like 10 different times, so this new word gets seen by 10 different people and all of them type the exact same thing for the new word, then that word becomes digitized with very high probability. And that's how the, the whole digitization process works. This happened to be a trick that worked really well. Um, this is, is helping to digitize approximately 100 million words a day, uh, which is the equivalent of about 2 million books a year, all being digitized one word at a time by just having people type CAPTCHAs on the internet. Uh, thank you. Now, so this is, this is a, this turned into, it started as a, as a project at Carnegie Mellon University, then we turned it into a company, then this was acquired by Google to help with the book digitization process. Uh, now, because we are serving so many of these pairs of words, now, now what we're giving, every time we do this, we're giving usually two randomly chosen English words right next to each other, and for one of them, the system doesn't know what it is. So this has, you know, the potential of showing pretty interesting and funny things sometimes. So for example, we showed this word, the word Christians. There's nothing wrong with it by itself, but, but if you put it along with another randomly chosen word, bad things can happen. So for example, we showed this. <laughs> okay. Oops, it's kind of bad. Well, it's particularly bad because this particular instance was shown, you know, this system is used by literally millions of websites. This particular instance was shown in a website that happened to be called the Embassy of the Kingdom of God. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, this one's from a few years ago. Uh, politician, johnedwards.com. <laughs> and unfortunately, there's just not much we can do to protect against this because for one of the words, we just don't know what it is. So there's just no way to, to protect it. So we basically are insulting people left and right every day, and well, that's what we're doing. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about this particular project. I'm going to move on to another project, a uh, completely different project, uh, but you'll see the similarities. Okay, so forgetting about CAPTCHAs, forgetting about anything, uh, I want to talk about the problem of labeling images with words. So the problem is as follows. This is something that we would like to have a method to do this at very large scale. If a computer could do it, that would be amazing, but we can't quite get computers to do this as well as humans can yet. Uh, and the, the problem is this. You're given an image. And now you're what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to label it with words that describe this image in a manner that is accurate, so for example. Okay. Now, this... This project, by the way, was done about 10 years ago, and at the time, computers simply could not do this. Today, computers can do maybe parts of this, but in general, computers are not perfect at really describing an image with words in the way that humans can. Humans can give very, very accurate descriptions of images with words. Computers cannot yet do that. However, having a method that could accurately label images with words would have many, many different applications, one of which I'm sure you've interacted with almost daily, which is, for example, image search on the web. So whenever you go to Google, you can Google for images of something. So for example, you can type dog, and you get back a lot of images that are of dogs. Now, because computers are not very good at telling exactly the contents of an image, the way image search on the web has worked is by using file names usually, or HTML text near the image. So for example, whenever you search for the query dog, what Google returns to you is a lot of images that somebody named dog.jpg. That's kind of, and it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good, it's pretty good if somebody named the image dog.jpg, there's probably a dog in it. Uh, so that's kind of how it has worked in the past. Of course, this is not perfect, and you know, for example, in this uh, page of results, there's an image of a rabbit right there, or there's a guy in a blue suit. What the hell? Um, <laughs> but if we had a method that could accurately tell us for all images exactly what's in that image, we could greatly improve image search on the web. And we could do all kinds of other things if we could accurately describe images uh, with words. Okay? So what we want, and this is what, something I worked on about 10 years ago, is a method that can label all images on the web in a way that's fast and cheap. Now, at the time, uh, the idea that occurred to me was to 
uh, rather than try to use computers to do it, because at the time computers just weren't able to do it, was to figure out if there was a way to get a ton of humans to do it for us for free. <laughs> and it turns out you can do that as well. And what I did is I did this thing. It was called the ESP game. Uh, this is a game that became very popular, I don't know, 15 years ago, some 12 years ago. Uh, and it had the property that as people were playing it, it was very fun, but as people were playing it, they were also labeling random images from the web without really knowing that they were doing that and doing so very effectively and accurately. And let me explain how the, how the game worked. Okay, so first of all, it was a two-player online game. Okay, so you had to go to the internet. It was a website. And you got randomly paired with somebody else that was wanting to play the game at the time. as a complete stranger. You didn't know anything about them. Okay? The partners knew nothing about each other, and they also couldn't communicate. So you were paired with a total stranger. You couldn't communicate. Uh, and the object of the game was to type the exact same word, given that the only thing you two have in common is that you can see the same image. Okay, so you show up to a website, you can see an image, you're told there's somebody else in the world that can see the exact same image as you, you can type now, they cannot see what you're typing, but you can type, and they, they can type, and the goal is for both of you to type the exact same thing. Okay, and guess what happens? What happens is the only thing that people have in common is that image, so they just start typing a lot of things describing the image until one of my words is equal to one of their words, and then we win. So basically, this is kind of how it goes. So imagine there's two randomly you know, chosen players that, that are seeing the same image. At first, uh, the first player may say car. The second player may say boy. It's not a match, so they're still going. Then maybe the first player says hat or kid. They're still not a match, so they're still going. But at some point, maybe player two says car, which is a word that the player, the player one had already entered, the same word, they get points, and then they get a new image. Okay, that's the basic idea of how the game works. Uh, and this game became extremely popular. This is what it looks like. Well, this is what it used to look like. Uh, you can tell the, the sign is very dated. Um, but this is, this is what it looked like for one of the players. And the idea is that you basically just got an image, and you just had to type a lot of words describing the image. And it turned out that these words that people typed were really, really good descriptors for the image. And the, in particular, the ones that people matched on were usually really, really good descriptors for the image because they came from two essentially independent sources. Both of them said, this image is of that. Okay? And you know, there's a lot of different things that were, you know, the game was a lot more complicated. So for example, we had this thing called taboo words. These are words that when you were trying to play the game, you could not use to try to describe that image. These were actually words that the game already had collected from previous matches. So in previous times that this image passed through the game, it got dog and pillow. Now people had to enter other stuff. And basically, this allowed us to collect a lot of really different uh, informa you know, uh, labels for each word. Uh, at some point, this game uh, became so popular that also Google bought it. They changed the name to a very uh, lame name, the Google Image Labeler. <laughs> uh, but this was used to label a very significant fraction of all images on the web to make it so that computers really could understand images a lot better. And this was all done by humans playing a game who just gave the information to computers to improve image search. OK. Last project that I want to talk about. Let's talk about two projects, uh, reCAPTCHA, ESP game. Now I want to talk about the current project that I'm working on. It's a project called Duolingo. Uh, I have a question. How many of you have heard of Duolingo? OK, good. How many of you use Duolingo? OK, good, good, good number. Uh, OK, uh, if you don't know what Duolingo is, is, it's a language learning website or app. OK, now let me tell you kind of how I started Duolingo. I started Duolingo about five or six years ago. Um, I was in a very um, fortunate position in my life. I had just sold my second company to Google. And so I wanted to work on a project that was really related to my passion. And my passion has always been education. I, I, that's the reason I became a professor. So I wanted to do something related to education. Now, my views on education are very related to where I'm from. Uh, I am from Guatemala. This is a public service announcement. That is where Guatemala is. <laughs> it's right there. Very important. That is not where they keep the prisoners. That is called Guantanamo. <laughs> not the same. Now, other than being a shithole country, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, 
Guatemala is not a very wealthy nation. And my views on education are very related to where I'm from. I'm from Guatemala, and, and, and my views on education, you know, a lot of people say that education is something that brings equality to different social classes. And I, I always thought it was the opposite. I always thought education is something that brings inequality to social classes, because what happens is, especially in countries like Guatemala, is the people who have money can buy themselves the best education in the world, and because they are so well-educated, they continue having money, whereas the people who don't have very much money, they barely learn how to read and write, and because of that, they never are able to make any money. And so it's this thing that always remains, you know, the people who have money always have money, the people who don't have money never have money. Um, so I wanted to do something that would give equal access to education to everybody. Now, uh, education is very general, so I decided to concentrate on one type of education, um, and it is learning a foreign language, which is, happens to be huge everywhere in the world, except in the United States. Um, <laughs> But it turns out there are 1.2 billion people around the world learning a foreign language. Now, this is a very interesting market. So 1.2 billion people are learning a foreign language. It's a very interesting market. Two-thirds of these people, 800 million of them, satisfy three properties. First, they're learning English. Second, the reason they're learning English is to get a job or a better job. Uh, and third, they are of low socioeconomic conditions. Okay, so. Basically, most people that are trying to learn a foreign language are basically trying to learn English in order to get out of poverty. Now, before we launched Duolingo, most of the ways there were to learn a language were very expensive. So, for example, there was Rosetta Stone. RIP Rosetta Stone. Uh, there was Rosetta Stone. They, it, it, this is a thing that cost about $1,000. Uh, in other parts of the world, for example, there was a thing called uh, Open English, which was also a system that cost about $1,000. So there's this irony that most of the people who were trying to learn a language uh, were, doing, were, you know, were doing so in order to get out of poverty, but it seemed like you needed $1,000 in order to get out of poverty. This <laughs> made no sense. So what we decided to do, me and my co-founder, about five years ago, is to launch Duolingo, which the idea was forever it's going to be a 100% free way to learn a language, no matter what. Okay. And so we launched it, um, and since then it has become very popular. Today, Duolingo is the most popular way to learn languages in the world. Um, there's a lot of really interesting statistics. For example, um, there are more people learning languages on Duolingo in the United States than there are people learning languages in the whole U.S. public school system. Um, we teach a lot of languages. We teach, you know, we teach the languages you've heard of, like Spanish, English, German, etc. But we also teach some smaller languages. For example, we teach Irish. <laughs> I'll be honest, I didn't realize Irish was a language. <laughs> I thought they spoke English in Ireland, which overwhelmingly they do. But it turns out there is a thing called Irish. Uh, now, Irish has 94,000 native speakers. In Duolingo, we have about a million people actively learning Irish. So we could actually multiply the number of speakers of Irish by a factor of 10. Uh, another interesting thing, on a single given day in the year, St. Patrick's Day, the number of learners of Irish on Duolingo doubles. <laughs> this happens. They are also very, very inaccurate, so I assume they're drunk. This is what happens. Um, and, and, you know, this has been really rewarding. For example, in the case of Irish, um, the, the president of Ireland decided to give us a, an award for the fact that we are helping revive the language. Now, by the way, if you've never seen a picture of the president of Ireland, I recommend you go and find what the president of Ireland looks like, because he looks exactly like what you would think the president of Ireland looks like. <laughs> that guy in the center is the president of Ireland. <laughs> The others are some people that work for Duolingo to win, to win to receive the award. Now, now, why is Duolingo so popular? Let me just show you some of the things that people have said. So, for example, this person said, in the past two days, they've learned more from Duolingo than in four years of high school. Now, I think that says more about high school. <laughs> Duolingo's not that good. <laughs> uh, or there is this other person. That was my mother. <laughs> 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 uh, 
she likes it. Uh, but in reality, I mean, probably the, the reason that Duolingo has become so popular is because early on we realized one thing. We realized that the hardest thing about learning anything by yourself, or learning a language by yourself, is to keep yourself motivated. It's very, you know, learning a language or learning anything by yourself, it's, it's kind of like going to the gym. Everybody wants to do it. But, oh man, it's really hard. <laughs> and it's really hard to stay motivated. So what we decided to do is we decided to make Duolingo feel as much like a game as possible. Okay, based on, for example, my experience in the past of creating games that get people to label images, etc. the idea with Duolingo is we were going to make a game that would make it so much fun to just learn a language. Okay, so this is, for example, what the uh, home screen of Duolingo looks like on Android devices. Uh, the idea is that we split up the language into multiple different units. Um, so, for example, there's a unit called food. That's where you learn all the things about food in the language, like how to order in a restaurant or, you know, what to call a potato or whatever. Um, there's animals. That's where you learn all the different names of animals, etc. And the idea is that at the very beginning, only one of these skills is unlocked. And then you have to complete that skill to unlock the next row of skills. Then you have to complete the next row to unlock the next row, etc. So there's this unlocking mechanism that is really rewarding when you're playing. Um, there's also those bars, hopefully you can see them, underneath each one of those skills. Those bars measure how well we think you know the content of the, uh, that's in there. So for example, for this particular player, they know food really well, but they don't know, for example, the skill basics one that well. Okay? And those bars are basically, we, what we do is we look at everything that the users are doing every, every time that they do anything on Duolingo, and then we update those bars. So if they get something wrong that is related to food, then that food bar goes down a little bit, whereas if they get something right, that food bar probably goes up a little bit. Also, those bars naturally decay if you don't use Duolingo. That's, it, that's to model forgetting, because if you, don't, if you don't practice your language for a while, you start forgetting. So what happens is if you don't use Duolingo, those bars just over time start going lower and lower and lower, which, by the way, gives an incentive for people to come back often to use Duolingo because they want to keep their bars full. Okay, so OCD is an ex excellent motivator. <laughs> um, now, inside, inside in each, each one of those um, skills, the way the lessons on Duolingo actually work is at no point do we get you to read a lot of grammar or just read theory or anything. We, we have found that whenever we try to get people to read grammar, they go away. Uh, so instead, everything that you're learning, you're learning by doing. So you're basically learning everything with many little exercises in which you have to do things like translate a text or speak to the app and it tells you whether you said it correctly or not or pick the right image that is related to the word, etc. And the idea is that there's this bar at the top and at the beginning of every lesson, the bar is empty. But whenever you get an exercise correct, the bar fills up a little bit. And whenever you get an exercise wrong, the bar goes down. And the whole purpose of the, the, the you know, kind of mini game is to fill up that whole progress bar. Okay, so that's kind of how it works. Now, if you've ever used Duolingo, you're very familiar with all of this, but what you may not know is that there's a tremendous amount of sophistication in the background trying to teach you better that you may not even realize. Let me just tell you some of the things that we do. For example, that progress bar at the top that goes up when you get something right and down when you get something wrong does not move the same amount depending on the exercise. Because for every exercise, we actually have a pretty good idea of how hard the exercise is for you in particular, because we've watched you learn on Duolingo for the whole time you've been learning, so we know how good you are at all kinds of concepts. We know how good you are at conjugating in the present tense. We know how good you are at using articles or adjectives. We know how good you are at every given word. So whenever we give you an exercise, we have a pretty good idea of whether you're going to get that exercise right or wrong. And sometimes we give you exercise that we know you're going to get wrong. Turns out that's a pretty good thing for motivation, because if you always get everything right, that's not fun. Um, so we give you exercises, and we know how hard they're going to be for you. And if we give you a really hard exercise and you get it right, that bar moves up a lot, because we did not expect you to get that right. So that, that moves up a lot. <laughs> However, if we give you a very hard exercise and you get it wrong, 
the bar moves down only a little bit because, hey, anyways, we thought you were going to get it wrong. <laughs> so there's, you know, the, the bar does not move uniformly, and also the precise sequence of exercises that we give you are specifically tailored to do two things, to try to teach you optimally and also to try to keep you motivated. And the best way to express this trick that we use, it's a lot more sophisticated than this, but it's the following. You know, in casinos, whenever you're doing the slot machine, that, that you have to get three of a kind, whenever you get two of a kind and the last one is different, you're significantly more likely to do it again. Because you think, almost. <laughs> we use that exact same trick, just in a lot more sophisticated of a way, to give you exercises that we get you to feel like that you got wrong, but you almost got right. And we give you a lot of those exercises, and then that's the type of thing that we use as a trick to keep you motivated. So we're getting you addicted to learning, sorry. Um, now, when we started Duolingo, um, it was started by me. I am a computer scientist by training, and my PhD student, who is also a computer science by, scientist by training, we didn't know anything about how to teach languages. Um, my language learning experience is I learned English at a very early age, and I do not remember having learned English. And then when I was in high school, I decided to take a French class because I had a crush on a girl. <laughs> I failed at both. <laughs> that happened. So that was my, this is my curriculum, that's my entire language learning, my CV of language learning experiences is that. Uh, so I didn't really know anything about learning languages. So we decided, but we wanted to make this language learning platform. So what we decided to do is we decided to read a bunch of books on how to best teach languages. Uh, we literally read French for Dummies, and we read a bunch of other books. Um, at some point, we found a book that was called something like The Best Method to Learn a Language. And it was kind of a, a, a scientific book that had all kinds of scientific evidence, and it, it really seemed convincing that this really was the absolute best method to learn a language. And we thought we had struck gold because we thought, hey, this is a, not a super well-known book, but it, you know, we're pretty convinced this is the best method to learn a language, so all we have to do is turn this book into an app, and then that's it. Um, unfortunately, my PhD student, who is a lot more thorough than I am, kept on reading more and more books. At some point, he found another book that also claimed to be the absolute best method to learn a language <laughs> that was completely contradictory to the first one and had a lot of scientific evidence backing it up, too. And then we got confused, and so we didn't know what to do, and, and we realized, it turns out, Nobody really knew what the best way to learn a language was. There are a ton of philosophies about how to best learn a language, and nobody really knew. I mean, there's, there's, all, kinds of, there's all kinds of things, but we, you know, we were engineers, and we were, just trying to find, we were just trying to find the answers to very simple questions. We didn't care all that much about your philosophy here or your philosophy there. We just wanted to know, should we teach plurals before adjectives? Or should we teach you know, adverbs after whatever, adjectives. We were trying to really just ask very simple engineering questions. And there didn't, there, for some of them, there was clear uh, agreement. But for many of, of them, nobody really knew the answer. So what we decided to do is we decided to just launch Duolingo with whatever we could, and whatever we could learn from the books. And then at some point, Duolingo started becoming very, very popular. And we realized we were in a unique position which is we could actually now find the answers to the questions we originally had through our users. Because you see, we have so many users now that if we want to figure out whether we should teach plurals before adjectives or adjectives before plurals, we can just run an experiment on our own users. So for example, for the next 50,000 people that sign up, at random, to half of them, we can teach them plurals before adjectives to the other half, we can teach them adjectives before plurals, and then we measure which ones learn better. And then we can know once and for all, at least in our system, is it better to teach plurals before adjectives or adjectives before plurals. And we keep doing these experiments all the time, and, and this is easy for us because, for example, I said 50,000 users. It takes about six hours for us to get 50,000 new users on Duolingo. So we're having so many users come through the system that we could just, at every time, at any point in time, we are running about 100 experiments where we're trying to improve the way we teach. So Duolingo is literally getting better week by week. And of course, it also means that if you're using Duolingo, we are probably experimenting on you. <laughs> that didn't sound so good. But it's, for, it's in the name of science. We are improving Duolingo. Um, and this has really worked. So for example, um, 
Uh, somebody at the City University of New York did a little experiment to figure out how effective Duolingo is. And they found that if you use Duolingo for 34 hours, you learn the equivalent of one semester of university education in that language, okay, which is pretty good because usually a semester of uh, education in, in a university takes a lot longer than 34 hours with all the homework. Um, so it's pretty effective. Um, but there's one thing that a lot of people have told us, and this is kind of when, where one of the uses of AI comes in. Um, we know that Duolingo is about as good as a classroom, at least for the beginner students. students. But we know also that Duolingo is not yet as good as a human tutor. So if you really want to learn a language and you have infinite amounts of money, what you should do is hire a human tutor. A good human tutor, a shitty human tutor is not going to do anything. <laughs> but, a, but a good human tutor will be really, really good. Uh, and in fact, there's a very famous um, study that's called the uh, Bloom Two Sigma study, um, which shows the following. And this is, this is not just true of learning a language, this is true of anything. Um, we have found, or science has found that if you compare the, the academic, um, you know, how well people do in a class, you take somebody who's in a class of, you know, size 20, so a classroom of, with 20 kids, and you compare their performance to somebody who is not in that classroom but has a one-on-one -on -one human tutor, usually the, one -on -one hum the, the person who has a one-on-one -on -one human tutor is better than 98% of the people in the classroom. So we know this, and that's why it's called two sigma. It's two standard deviations better than the mean. Uh, so basically, we know that people who have a one-on-one -on -one human tutor are better than people being in a classroom. Today, Duolingo is a, by itself is about as good as a classroom, a beginner classroom. What we want Duolingo to be is to be as good as a human tutor. This is, this is the next goal. This is what we're doing. So we're working to make Duolingo as good as a good human tutor. Um, and this is one of the things that we're... we're still experimenting with this in some versions of Duolingo, um, where instead of just doing the little exercises that Duolingo is very well known for, um, we have changed the whole user interface so that the whole thing is basically like a conversation with a tutor. However, the conversation with a tutor on the other end is not a human, it's an artificial intelligence. Okay, and we're hoping that with this, we're going to be able to get as good as a human tutor. We're not there yet. Um, but we're doing that. Uh, this is just something else. This is, uh, this, is, um, this, is, this is a map of the world, in case you didn't know. Uh, but what this is, is we've color-coded every single country with the most popularly learned language on Duolingo. So we have users in every single country in the world. We have a lot of users in every single country in the world. And you can tell here, for example, English is the language that is, learned, that is most commonly learned in most countries. In the United States, it's Spanish, represent. Uh, in, in Canada, it's France. There's some interesting stuff here, but for those of you who are really paying attention, you'll find this single most interesting data point in this map. And it is that in Sweden, <laughs> the most popularly learned language on Duolingo is Swedish. <laughs> It's very, very strange. <laughs> At first, when this, our, our data science team showed me this graph, I thought, you guys made a mistake. This, this makes no sense. Uh, and they went and looked again, et cetera. And it turns out it, no mistakes were made. By far, in Sweden, the most popular learned language is Swedish. But it turns out, and this is something we just had not realized, we also know on Duolingo what the native language is of the people who are using Duolingo. We know, we know what your native language is. It turns out that these people in Sweden that were learning Swedish, overwhelmingly their na native language was Arabic. Okay, so what's happening here is that Sweden has... In Sweden, nobody needs to learn English for some reason, because they are born knowing English somehow. <laughs> and Swedish, of course, as well. Uh, but it turns out that a lot of the people who are using Duolingo in Sweden are actually refugees trying to learn the native language. And then we actually went to see, and this is true across many countries in Europe, it doesn't happen to be the most popularly learned language, but a very highly learned language is usually the country's language, and it's usually by people whose native language is Arabic. So Duolingo is being used by refugees throughout many places in the world because, well, it's free. Thank you. And the last part, uh, this is just the last little part of the, 
of the talk. Um, it's it's th this new project that we started working on at Duolingo, um, and, and it is related to this fact that this map is mostly whatever, purple or pink or whatever that color is. Um, the most people in the world are trying to learn English. Um, about two years ago, maybe three years ago, uh, we started getting a lot of emails from people who were learning English on Duolingo who said to us, thank you so much for teaching me English. Um, I wasn't able to learn English before, but Duolingo is 100% free. Yeah, I can now learn English. Thank you, thank you. But I now have a problem. And it is that I need a certificate that shows that I know English for something. Uh, and there's all kinds of things. You know, they may have needed a certificate for their job because their job was asking for it, or maybe they were applying to a university and the university required them to have a certificate that they knew English or whatever. So we started getting a lot of people asking us for certificates that they knew English. Uh, and then we started kind of looking into this, into this, this whole English language certification, and what we found was pretty insane. At least what I thought was pretty insane. Um, so it turns out about $10 billion a year are spent by people having to certify that they know English. Okay? And let me tell you why they may do that. For example, if you are a foreign student that wants to come to the United States for college, let's say here in Arizona, uh, the universities um, require you to take a standardized test called the TOEFL, Test of English as a Foreign Language, to prove that you know English. Okay, so if you want to come to the U.S. for college, you have to take a test that proves that you know English. If you want to get a work visa in the U.K. and you're from a non-English speaking country, you have to take a standardized test that proves that you know English. If you want to work for many multinational corporations in countries other than the United States, you have to take a test that proves that you know English. If you want to graduate from many universities in other countries, they make it a requirement that you take a standardized test that proves that you know English, etc. So there's a lot of reasons why you may need to take such a test. $10 billion a year are spent by people taking these tests. And all of these tests are very similar. There's a few of them. The TOEFL is one of them. Uh, the IELTS is another one. Uh, there, there's a few of them. Uh, all of them. So, uh, they work about the same. Basically, you have to pay them about $250 to take the test. Um, you also have to go to a testing center to take the test. Uh, the reason you have to go to a testing center is to prevent cheating, to so make sure that you are you. Uh, and you, because you have to go to a testing center, you have to make an appointment. So you, you have to make an appointment weeks in advance, pay $250, go to this testing center, then wait a few more weeks, and then eventually the whole process takes about eight weeks and then you get your certificate that says, yeah, you know English. Okay, this sounds annoying, because it sounds like it's from the 1900s. Uh, <laughs> sounds annoying, uh, but it's way worse, because, you see, most of these people that are trying to certify that they know English are from developing countries. And in a developing country, that whole math changes. $250, that's a month's salary. The testing center that they have to go to, they're not in every city. They're only in some cities. So you may have to travel to take this test, and you may have to spend you know, your month's salary, and you have to wait for weeks for the process. And so it's this crazy, annoying thing that I think is also something else that is becoming a barrier for people actually wanting to progress uh, if they have to have this certificate. So, uh, and when we were doing that, I, I actually remembered that I had, I had blocked this memory. I had to take, I am from Guatemala, I grew up in Guatemala, I had to take a test to prove that I knew English, the TOEFL, when I came here to the United States. It turned out that in Guatemala, in my country, they ran out of tests my year. <laughs> so I had to travel to the neighboring country of El Salvador to take the freaking test. So for me, it cost like $1,500 to take the test. I have forgotten how ridiculous this was. I had blocked it off my memory, but now I remember, and it's like this crazy thing. And I also remember that when I was that age, I thought, later, I'm going to do something to get rid of this stupid process. And so I'm doing that, and this is what we're doing. So about, about two years ago, we launched this thing. So about two years ago, we launched this thing called the Duolingo English Test. So it is our direct competitor to all of these other standardized English tests. However, it's from like, you know, now as opposed to 50 years ago. So for example, the test is not $250. I don't understand why a test needs to be $250, because it costs $10 to administer it. Don't understand that. So our test is, depending on the region, 
we, we, we vary the prices. If the country is wealthier, we, we charge $50. If not, we charge $20. So our, our test is you know, somewhere between $20 and $50. Um, also, our test, you can take it from your phone or from your computer. You don't have to go anywhere to take it, and you get your results immediately. Now, there's a lot of things to say about this test. First of all, we had to solve a lot of problems. Um, the first problem we had to solve was, well, we had to make a test that could accurately test whether you spoke English. It turns out that was the easiest problem to solve. Not that hard to make a test that can prove that you know English. So we, we did that. Second thing, a little harder, uh, we had to prevent cheating. Because you see, the reason you have to go to a testing center is to make sure that you are not cheating, that you are you and not your friend, and also that you didn't show up with like a computer that helps you answer all the questions. Um, so the way we prevent cheating is we get you to take the test from your own computer, but we actually turn on the front-facing camera of the computer or the device, and also the microphone, and we record you taking the test, and then a real human actually watches you taking the test to make sure that you're not cheating. Uh, and it turns out it's very easy to catch cheaters. We get a lot of, about 8% of the people who take our tests are trying to cheat. It's very easy to catch cheaters. This is what cheating looks like from one of our videos. You're just looking at a face of a person, and they're going like this. <laughs> that is what cheating looks like. <laughs> so we created a test. We had to prevent cheating. And then there's the hardest problem that we've had to solve for this. And it is we have to convince every single person that accepts, or not person, every single organization that accepts the other tests to accept our test. That has been the hardest part. Um, fortunately, over the last two years, we've made a lot of headway. Uh, to this day, about 180 different US universities are, are accepting our test in, you know, in, at the same level as the TOEFL, so you can either take our test or the TOEFL. Many of them are very well known, like UCLA, Yale, Tufts, Santa Clara, some departments of Harvard, et cetera, are now actually accepting this test. So that's going pretty well. I mean, we're not there yet. You know, in the US, there's something like three to 4,000 universities. We only have like 180, so we're, we're getting there. Um, but to me, one of the most interesting things was um, in this, this quote-unquote sales process where we're trying to get universities to accept our test, just like the TOEFL, um, how, how the sales pitch has changed over time. When we started, I started by going to the university that I was a professor at, Carnegie Mellon University, I showed up and I said, hey, we have this test, it's great, look, and my, my argument is it's good for the world. This was my argument, and listen to why it's good for the world. And I, I had a whole spiel about how it, why it was good for the world. This argument did not seem to sway anybody. <laughs> <laughs> the good for the world, I don't think they cared all that much. Uh, and then I, we tried it with other universities and we were like, no, but it's good for the world. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I agree, it's good for the world, thanks. And <laughs> that was that. Uh, at some point, we got this bright idea, which was um, when we are testing people, we actually are recording them, uh, you know, while they're taking the test, the camera's on, we're recording them. We thought, well, if we're doing that, why don't we just, at the end of the test, get them to answer one question? It's kind of free answer of the question, and we're going to package a little 90-second video that we will attach with the score. So whenever, if you're a university, not only will you get a score from the test, you'll get a 90-second video of the person talking in English. And then when we started showing these videos to all the universities, that's when they were like, oh yeah, yeah, sure, let's do that. Uh, let me show you one of these videos, what it looks like, and it's because it's really interesting. So this is, this is going to be a person, they just finished their test. This particular person got an 82% in the Duolingo English test. So it's one thing for me to tell you 82%. You don't really know what this means, but you'll now know exactly what this means by watching this person. Okay, so here we go. Hopefully the audio works. Talk about a funny incident that happened to you. What happened? And who else was there? I would say, uh, I wouldn't call this an incident, but it's one of the, my favorite thing uh, when I'm still learning English. Remember when I was, uh, like really young, around like 10 years old, I tried to read uh, articles and I always see the author as anonymous. And I don't quite know what anonymous mean and I thought it's a writer, it's a writer of some sort. Um, so I, when I increase my reading amount um, and I see more stories or essays that's written by this author called uh, Anonymous, and I was wondering who that author is, and 
I really respect him as an author because like he can do like poetry, he can do novels, he can do um, scientific ethic, um, essays, and I think that's really impressive. And um, one day when I was preparing preparing for a、uh, vocabulary test, I I learned the word anonymous, and that means without a name. So I I feel like that's a pretty funny. And that's happened to me when I'm learning English. So, after you show that to admissions offices, they really want to have these videos because it's much better to see how well they speak English by just seeing that versus a score that's you know 82 percent. And this is something that's really interesting, and this really gets back to. You know what can humans do that computers can't?、Um, you know the, the standardized English tests, for example, the TOEFL is a test that takes about four hours.、It、takes four hours to do, and in four hours they have to answer these questions, answer these other questions, all kinds of things. And after four hours, they believe they have a good idea of how well the person speaks English after they've te tested everything. The tests that we originally have on a computer, when we designed our own test to be taken on a computer, our test takes 30 minutes, not four hours. And there was a reason for that. We realized that we could not have a test that lasted four hours if you're going to be able to take it from a mobile device in a village somewhere in India, because what your your mobile device is going to run out of battery in four hours. Like it's just not possible. So one of our design considerations was the test must last at most 30 minutes. Now, as soon as we put that out there,、uh, of course, of course, the people who develop these other tests that are billion-dollar businesses, they don't like us.、Um, And one of the one of the things that people said to us was, it is impossible to tell whether somebody speaks English with a test that only lasts 30 minutes. It's impossible. And then to them I say, you just saw this guy for 90 seconds, and you can figure out exactly how well this guy speaks English. So humans can tell within you know a couple of minutes how well somebody speaks English. So it's this amazing thing. I mean, computers have. Are just not yet as good as humans at telling how well somebody speaks English, but we should be able, at some point, to be able to determine somebody's English level in two minutes as opposed to 30 minutes. And certainly, you don't need four hours.、Um, so, well, that's that's all I had. I'm I'm out of time. This is Duolingo.com. If you want to see it, thank you. Thank you very much. You see him.、Uh, even after there was rain and snow, thanks so much for everything you did. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.